The following podcast is not meant for children or for liberals, even though that's pretty much the same thing these days, but that's what we're here for. Somebody's got to keep these brats in line. Anyway, you've been warned. It's the right opinion. These days, our media is either incompetent or malevolent. They don't believe in heaven, but they acting like they haven't sent. Knowing the truth is way harder than telling it. We gotta work harder, gotta be more intelligent. Sometimes we just gotta grab a mic and start yelling shit. We're living in times when it's hard to stay relevant. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Boom. Welcome back to The Right Opinion right here on the right Opinion. Dot podbean.com, humming media group dot podbean.com, and rat salad review.com. I, of course, am your host, Harrison Bergeron. Happy to have you all aboard. As always, we've got a lot of stuff to talk about. We've got actually a little bit of right opinion news that we'll talk about at the very end of the show, but we've got plenty going on in the world of culture, in the world of politics, in the world of pregnant women getting new military outfits it's a wonderful world isn't it these are the truly important issues of our time and while i mock that i do have to get into an issue that seems silly on its surface but i'm going to start here candace owens versus cardi b the twitter feud that shook the world i know this on its surface seems like a really silly thing to waste time about on a news program but nevertheless There is some important underlying things that are worth pointing out as a result of this Candace Owens versus Cardi B never-ending Twitter feud, apparently. This will never end. This will go on. This is the Ali Frazier of goddamn Twitter feuds. It will never end, and it is wonderful, and it is. is, I love it every time, mostly because it just proves how ridiculous people on the left are, i.e. Cardi B, and how logical and rational and reasonable and more intelligent people on the right are a.k.a. Candace Owens. So, what happened here exactly? Well, let's start back at the Grammys. I know none of you watched it, so I'll let you know what happened. There was a performance there from Cardi B and her doppelganger, Megan Thee Stallion. I mean, I barely could tell these bitches apart, but neither here nor there. They have a song called WAP, which stands for Wet Ass Pussy. And... (laughs) I know. What a weird world we live in where this is not only something that's out there and popular, but getting honored and performed at the Grammy Awards of all places. Now, I mean, for those of you who pay attention to award shows or at least have over the course of time, I haven't since probably the VMAs in 2009, I want to (laughs) say. Like, it's been that long. The only reason I remember that, or maybe it was the movie awards, is because it was 999. And that's probably the last award show I've ever actually sat down and taken some serious time to watch. So we're we're over a decade of, of award show free, other than some clips here and there. Obviously, we all saw Ricky Gervais a couple years ago completely roast all of Hollywood, and rightfully so. I think that was at the, Glo- the Oscars or the Golden Globes. But Cardi B performs WAP with Megan The Stallion at the Grammys, and basically it's just performative lesbian porn. Uh, they are grinded on each other, and uh, I think there was some scissoring involved, and look, I mean, I'm a guy, so on a certain level, I could sort of appreciate this. I'm also a father, so on a certain level, I'm just disgusted at the fact that this is something that, you know, my daughter doesn't live with me. She could have been sitting at home watching the Grammys with her mother, who I believe is smart enough to not have her watch these sorts of things for these reasons. She's relatively unwoke as a, as I am was one of the few things that we see eye to eye on on a regular basis but man like the fact that my 13 year old daughter who's oh she's about to be 13 is could be watching this and for that matter friends of hers could be idolizing this sort of behavior is really disgusting to me that said it's also quite disgusting to Candace Owens a new mother herself who is now starting to you know it has always been very vocal about culture and about politics and about values well I mean now she's a mother so you could compound her thoughts on this to the nth degree because now she's got real skin in the game she is raising a child in this world and doesn't want to see this world completely fall into a wappish hellhole and I don't blame her obviously I agree with her so what exactly happened on this Twitter beef that went on here well obviously Candace called out Cardi for basically being a slut I'm not going to get into the whole back and forth here as far as the nitty gritty of it, but Cardi B fires back 
and uh, and and make some claims about Melania Trump, and then Candace obviously defends Melania, even though that probably wasn't necessary, nor does it really have anything to do with Candace. And then Cardi B comes over the top with a photoshopped tweet. It is an obviously photoshopped tweet because of what it says. It says something to the degree, uh, and this is supposedly a tweet from Candace Owens. It says something to the degree of, "Yes, my brother." cheated on, or yes, my husband cheated on me with my brother, and yes, when I asked if I could join, they said no. So, not only does Cardi B think that this might have actually happened to Candace Owens, based on a bunch of blogs that she posted headlines of, apparently all these idiots bought on this as well, and uh, and she, she was trying to substantiate a screenshotted tweet that was clearly photoshopped. I mean, uh, why, even if this did happen to Candace Owens, God forbid... A, why would she share that with the world? Like, hey, my my husband cheated on me with my brother. Let me tweet this out. Also, let me tweet out the fact that I asked to join, which is rather incestuous, and despite the fact that we don't like the kink shame in America anymore, that's still pretty taboo. Um, <laughs> I would, I hope, God. But Candace Owens apparently was was had her brother fucking her husband and asked to join, and then when none of that went her way, she decided to take to Twitter and tweet this out. This is the, the world that Cardi B lives in, where she thinks that people would actually do stuff like this. Candace fired back saying, A, that's a Photoshop tweet, and that's silly that you would even think that I would tweet something like that. And B, only one of our husbands sleeps around, honey, and it ain't mine. Ooh, sick burn from Candace and obviously Cardi B's men or man or whatever has uh, certainly not been very faithful. By, by the way, let's also point out at this point in time that Cardi B has openly admitted at points in her life to drugging and essentially raping men and forcing them to have sex with transgender people and uh, things along those lines. This, of course, makes Cardi B a hero in not only the black community, but in the female community and really just American society as a whole. Meanwhile, Candace Owens, fairly educated, extraordinarily well-spoken, well a well put together package of ideas and thoughts and values, all the things that you know. If if my daughter, for instance, needed a role model, and I my only options were Cardi B or Candace Owens, it would not even be a decision. I wouldn't even have to think about it. My daughter wouldn't even have to think about which one I might be thinking about. She would know exactly which one of these two I would rather her look up to. And it's not all that difficult for anybody who's still got a fucking brain in their head and 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 looks at these two women and thinks, wow, one of them's trash and the other one is Cardi B. Oh my God, these people need to be reevaluated. Lickety split. And so Cardi B... In addition to trying to slander Candace and her husband and her brother, um, doubled down, like I said, has was actually trying to substantiate her fake screenshotted, you know, uh, Photoshop tweet of Candace admitting to not only being cheated on by her husband with her brother, but then asking to join and being told no. All of this makes sense to Cardi B. She then posted all these blog headlines saying like, oh no, this is real. Look, look at here, all these people reporting on it. Yeah, they're just as dumb as you are, Cardi. And oh, by the way, most of us here on the right feel like it doesn't need to be said, but apparently it needs to be said. You can't believe everything you read on the internet. This is, again, an idol of, of the world here. Cardi B, one of the finest among us, and Candice LeRae is just some trash coon or whatever the fuck we decide to call her on any given day. But Black Lives Matter, though, I thought, anyway. So Candace handing it to Cardi, this will probably not be the last of it. But let's just keep in mind that Cardi B put that tweet out there. She's got millions of followers, and yeah, ultimately she deleted it. How many people do you think realized, uh, of the people that saw the tweet, liked the tweet, retweeted the tweet, how many of those people went back and saw that it was deleted? What is the likelihood that Cardi B would address the fact that she deleted them other than the fact that one day she may very well be forced to release a public statement saying that she deleted them because, you know, obviously Candace Owens is going to sue the pants off of her. Not that those pants were on, really, to begin with. Anyway, so can't, Cardi puts this information out there. Later she retracts it, but the bell has been rung. And as as Jesse Eisenberg's character, uh, Lex Luthor, in the original Justice League or the original Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice movie, uh, told us, you can't unring a bell. Which is, you, you, I mean, you could just touch it and it stops ringing. But once it's been rung, it has always been rung, regardless of whether or not you stopped it from ringing currently. And so, that is the case with Cardi B's 
slander of Candace Owens and her husband and her brother, all of that already out there, and, and the bell once again has been rung, that same thing applies to the Washington Post, very much in the same camp as Cardi B. They probably wrote at least one article saying that Cardi B won this exchange with Candace Owens for some weird reason. They feel the need to defend people that are just loathsome individuals, all of them. I mean, literally, virtually everyone on the left, uh, and in particular, some of these trashy-ass celebrity hoes. So the Washington Post had to do a retraction in the last week or so. Why, you may ask? Well, the Washington Post had originally reported a story. We all remember the phone call that Donald Trump had with uh, with, with Georgia Representative Brad Raffensperger, and uh, he told them to find the votes because he felt that there were invalid votes out there. He said to find, you know, you don't need to find 100,000 votes, you just need to find 12,000 because that was what he lost by at that particular moment in time. So basically, he was just saying that there is fraud. I think there's fraud. If you look into the fraud, you will find the fraud. And look, you don't need to find all of the fraud. You just need to find enough fraud to prove that there was enough fraud to overturn the election, which is basically what I've been saying this entire time. And he believes it to be true. So there's no reason to suggest that he was asking them to commit fraud. He was telling them to find the fraud that he thought existed and probably did but and we'll never know because it'll never actually be really looked into in any serious way that said the washington Repo post reported a second phone call that took place with the georgia official that was investigating the election they claimed that trump called this person and a single anonymous source told them that during the course of this phone call donald trump told them to quote find the fraud and that they would be a quote national hero if they did, well, A, let's start with the quotes that they reported. Not all that bad. Again, Trump felt there was fraud, so he was telling them to find it. If they looked for it, they probably would have found it. But again, they're not looking for it in any serious way. Second of all, if there was fraud on the scale that Donald Trump is purporting and they did find it, that person would be a national hero. So what he's saying there is an immoral or even illogical. All of it could very well be true. But again, we'll never actually find out. That said, he didn't say any of those things. He apparently didn't say any of those things. He told them to look into the fraud, and he told them that they had the most important job in America right now, both of which were true at that particular moment in time, or at least he felt they were true. He was not trying to bribe them or coerce them or do anything ill toward in any way, shape, or form other than ask them to look into the fraud that he believes existed. This is not radical. This isn't crazy. This shouldn't be controversial, but it was reported as such and uh, all based on a single anonymous source. Now, the thing that gets even weirder about this is that the Washington Post reported this based on a single anonymous source, basically breaking all rules of credible journalism because you're supposed to usually not only get a source, but corroborate that source. But you got a single anonymous source that the Washington Post reported on and then every other left-wing outlet corroborated the story, which means that they all either went to that same anonymous source and got confirmation of the anonymous source's original story, or they just made up a corroboration altogether, neither of which are really out of the left-wing playbook if we go all the way back, really, and this isn't even all that back that all that far, really, but if we go back to the Russian collusion hoax and the Steele dossier, that entire thing was just information laundering, is that an anonymous source told Christopher Steele, Christopher Steele wrote it in a report because he's some sort of fancy pants British spy, it lent credibility to it, he then brought that information to John Brennan, but didn't call it the Steele dossier, it was just a bunch of reports, then he took the Steele dossier to a bunch of other people, and they were like, holy crap, this information matches the information that the CIA gave us, because the CIA had the exact same information that was in the dossier to begin with, of course, that information matches up, it's the same information from the same source. But they all kind of ignored that. They all kind of like put their fingers in their ears and went la 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 as as you know in, as as order to give themselves plausible deniability. Another favorite term of these crooks in politics, in particular the ones on the left, cough cough, our president. Um, but neither here nor there at the moment is that they do this all the time. Is that they they first and foremost they cite anonymous sources, and when you see anonymous sources cited, you could pretty much guarantee that they're bullshit. But then when they say that they've corroborated this information. Through who? Through the same anonymous source they gave them the first time? Through absolutely nobody? Through somebody that they just know on the inside? Just, yeah, that sounds like that could have happened. Okay, corroborated. 
anonymous sources are completely unreliable. When they come from the left in the mainstream media in particular, how many times do they need to be proven wrong? Everything from the whistleblower on the fucking Ukraine call, the people that said that Trump made the suckers and losers comments, the people that said that Trump moved uh, the, 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 the MLK bust in the White House, all of these anonymous sources that popped up and were ultimately proven wrong, and yet the media continues to put them out there begging the question, why? Well, for the same reason, or at least along the same lines, as why Cardi B puts out misinformation on her Twitter account all the time, is because the bell cannot be unrung. They put this story out months ago. They put this story out before the Georgia election, leading people to possibly have a sour taste in their mouth, the Georgia the Senate runoff election, leaving people to possibly have a sour taste in their mouth about the Republicans, and then, obviously, two Democrats won those two seats, so they put out blatant misinformation ahead of an election, and then they retract it months after the fact. This is, this is not a bug. This is a feature. This is exactly what they're trying to do. They'll put out fake stories, and then in order to, you know, to, uh, to, to regain some form of credibility with their audience that starts to catch on to how fake their stories are, miraculously every so often, well, then they'll pull a retraction months down the road to say, hey, guys, we got this one wrong, even though it's way too late and everybody believes what they believe about this subject already. And it affected elections and it's affected months of discourse. Uh, it was even used as evidence in the election and the impeachment trial for Trump is that they use this story as one of the pieces of evidence. So an uncorroborated anonymous source from the Washington Post gets into an article, and then that article gets used as evidence in an impeachment trial for a president who wasn't even the president anymore. Any of this making sense to anybody? If your answer is no, congratulations, you're still sane. Which probably means you're not a higher up in our military these days. Um, uh, so th those of you may not have caught this, but apparently Tucker Carlson got himself into some hot water this week by addressing the fact that our military, mind you, our president, had like a press conference to talk about things, changes going on in our military. One of the things that were highlighted is that we now have military uniforms for pregnant combatants, obviously women, but we can't say that anymore. So m pregnant people in the military now have their own uniforms for them to wear. And this is obviously incredibly stupid. Because, let's face it, if we're trying to assemble the most lethal fighting force in the world, which we currently have, but maybe not for long, given that the wokeifying of America's military is upon us, if we are trying to have the most lethal fighting force possible, maybe pregnant women are not the best candidate for people to enlist in said fighting force. Now, might they have a role within the military? Absolutely. There's a role for just about everybody in the military. Paper needs to be pushed. Food needs to be cooked. You know... Ship decks need to be mopped. If you want to serve, there's a good chance you can serve without actually being in the infantry on the front lines, you know, taking bullets. There's there's roles in the military for just about everybody. That said, the wokeifying of our military, the fact that we're putting an emphasis on military uniforms for pregnant women while China is ramping up their military in order to eventually start a war with us. That's the plan, one way or another. It's going to come to a head where the U.S. and China are going to have some sort of military conflict. It's pretty much inevitable at this point that one day that will happen. Assuming that is, of course, you know, that we are still around long enough for that to happen because they're, they're attacking us on several fronts, obviously, along the lines of technology, they have a, a supply chain advantage over us. They obviously control a lot of our medical supplies and pharmaceuticals and things along those lines. Things that Trump was trying to scale back, by the way, but I'm sure that will just sort of go by the wayside along with all of the other good ideas that he was implementing under his presidency because President Useless Sack of Potatoes has no interest in the best interest of Americans. He just has an interest in making sure that Donald Trump's legacy is completely erased from time. Something that Trump was with Obama, but that's because Obama was pretty fucking terrible for this country. And uh, and a lot of the things that Trump reversed saw immediate positive results. Go figure. But the wokeifying of America's military is something that Ben Shapiro wrote about this week on The Daily Wire. I want to read a couple of the paragraphs from this article. I do have the article in the show notes. It is behind a paywall. My apologies for that. But hey, maybe it's a good time to subscribe on some level to The Daily Wire and give your money to people who don't hate you. But Shapiro writes in an op-ed on the Daily Wire this week. Uh, it actually starts, weirdly enough, this week. 
President Biden's military declared its first war on Fox News host Tucker Carlson. Carlson has committed the great sin of pointing out the oddity of the fact that the Biden White House had been promoting brand new uniforms for pregnant soldiers rather than America's military efficiency in the face of a rising Chinese military threat. This prompted spasms of apoplexy from top brass in the military itself. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said that the Pentagon was filled with revulsion at Carlson's comments, adding, we absolutely won't just take personal advice from a talk show. Army Sergeant Major Michael Grinston tweeted that women, quote, will dominate any future battlefield we're called to fight on, and quote, calling Carlson's words, quote, divisive. Marine Corps Master Gunnery Sergeant Scott H. Stalker, that's a lovely name. Uh, he is the senior enlisted leader of the U.S. Space Command. He was the uh, the military gentleman you've seen all over the media, by the way, uh, with a little video he put out ripping Tucker Carlson's comments. And uh, get back into the article here. He said that Carlson's opinion was, quote, based off actually zero days of service in the armed forces, end quote. So we're appealing to authority here. That's nice and cute. By the way, when the authority starts selling for talk, talk show hosts, they've lost their authority. Okay, don't sell for the marks, as uh, the great Ben Hameen would tell you. But moving on from there, now the military itself recognizes that pregnant women can't exactly staff frontline positions. At 20 weeks of pregnancy, pregnant soldiers in the Army are exempt from field duty, deployment, wearing individual body armor, standing at parade rest or attention for longer than 15 minutes, or participating in weapons training. Upon diagnosis of pregnancy, all pregnant soldiers are exempt from regular physical fitness training. And the military has itself reported in the past that mixed units underperform all male combat units. In 2015, a year-long Marine Corps report found that, according to NPR, quote, all male units were faster, more lethal, and able to evacuate casualties in less time. End quote. So yeah, the military is in, in some serious trouble right now. If we're more worried about fitting pregnant women who can't actually do any training or do any actual fighting with uniforms rather than, um, you know, focusing on how lethal we are and the efficiency of our fighting force and how quickly they can get casualties out of a given situation, how fast are they, how mobile are they, all of that good stuff. But no, we're worried about fitting pregnant women with uniforms and paying for people who think that they're women to get their dicks cut off with military funds. These are the things that are important to the Biden administration. Meanwhile, China is just up in the ante over there getting ready for the inevitable. And at the rate that we're going, they're going to fucking crush us. So last article here from uh, Shapiro, and then we'll move on to another story. He says, but the content of Carlson's words was less important than the reaction to them. For it was unprecedented for top members of the military to unite in excoriating a civilian opinion journalist. Had it happened on former President Trump's watch, the media undoubtedly would have used it as an example of politics infusing traditionally apolitical institutions. Dark buzzwords like authoritarian and fascist would have been tossed around casually. Yet when the military has mobilized to attack Carlson, the media cheered instead. And that really tells you everything you need to know is that when... Uh, when Tucker Carlson mentioned what's her nuts his name from the New York Times the other day, I've already forgotten her name because it's so irrelevant, but there's just a weirdo journalist who was uh, Taylor Lorenz. There you go. I actually remembered it because Carlson said it so many times. He was trying to trigger me into murdering her. He knew exactly what he was doing, obviously. But Taylor Lorenz gets attacked by Carlson. So Carlson in the media attacking somebody else in the media for being dishonest in their media ing. That, that seems pretty fair, right? They both have the rights to their opinion. And for that matter, so does this gentleman in the, in the military. But when Carlson, somebody who's just on the same level as, as Taylor Lorenz, they're both civilians, they're both journalists, they're both in the mainstream media in some way, shape, or form, that's fine. That's punching down, though, according to the left. But when the guy from the military, the guy who runs Space Command, goes out of his way to punch down at Tucker Carlson... That's all well and fine and good and dandy. You see how the, the, the standards are just inconsistent? And, and Shapiro's 100% right. If this had happened to, say, Taylor Lorenz and the, U, uh, the U.S. Space Command, uh, you know, the, the, the leader of U.S. Space Command was punching down at Taylor Lorenz while Trump was in office, it would have absolutely been painted as authoritarian and fascist and all of the nonsense that they're now saying um, Tucker Carlson was doing to Taylor Lorenz. Meanwhile, Tucker Carlson, a talk show host, a guy on a show on Fox News 
that you know maybe two, three million people watch on any given day is now being targeted by several members of the U.S. military. So the military trying to silence journalists, okay, but journalists trying to silence other journalists, which he wasn't even really trying to do anyway. He just simply, as a matter of fact, he probably pointed out more people towards Taylor Lorenz's work than were previously aware of it. So if nothing else, free advertising. But no, he kept saying her full name, guys. So obviously he was trying to trigger one of us into assassinating her. So the the standards are... are in flux, I guess, in uh, to, to be as generous about it as humanly possible, and they just continue to shift from ridiculous to even more ridiculous, which brings me to my next story. A reporter put out on his Twitter, I don't even know who this reporter is, but we're about to find out because I'm going to click on this link. This was reported from the dailywire.com, obviously Shapiro's outlet over there. They appear to be putting together some of the best, most concise news stories, which is why you'll see that I, I you know, cite them quite often on here. Uh, this is from Amanda Prestigamo. 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 Uh, uh, Amanda Presto. That's what we. That's what her Twitter handle is. But nevertheless, some idiot, Kate Sosin, at Shoe Leather Kate on social media. I believe Kate is a transgender woman, meaning she was born a man. And she says, it's okay to have debate and disagree, but folks in the media, the term, quote, biological males, end quote, is a serious anti-trans slur. You should not use it without noting that, end quote. So let's file this under people really believe this shit, is that now identifying biological males as biological males is a trans slur. So by simply stating the scientific fact that I am a biological male, is apparently somehow transphobic. Of course, these are from the same people that tell me trans women are women, which is weird because if they were women, then you you wouldn't have to tell me that, really. And there wouldn't be a different way to differentiate trans women from regular women. One is a trans woman. One is an actual woman. If the two were the same, there would be no differentiation. And for that matter... If we you want to live in a world where we have to recognize the trans woman as a woman, then we're still going to need to to differentiate in some way, shape, or form from the people who just think they're women and the people who are actually women. At some point in time, whether it be sports or schools or whatever the case may be, God knows they want to put quotas on people getting pulled over in certain areas. Are we going to start running around? trying to just, you know, we're now going to start pulling over trans women and marking them off as women and not trans people, and then we're going to have all these wacko statistics that show, like, trans people never actually get pulled over for any reason. It's it's hard to keep up with all the madness because they got so much of it going on up in the air all at once. It's like you could try to catch a few of them, but a few are going to get past you one way or another, and that's why we need to try to fight all these stupid little battles at every possible turn because otherwise this just becomes normal, where one day you'll wake up and using the term biological male will be considered some form of hate crime that could potentially get you fined or thrown in jail. And you might be laughing now, but this actually happens like in Germany, in England, in Canada right now, where they have speech laws that basically make it illegal to misgender people. And I assume classifying a male as a biological male when they think that they're a woman might very well fall into that category. And if we don't push back on it now... It's all over, folks. That's That will be the collapse of our civilization as we know it. Moving on from there, the border crisis. Well, uh, let me let Jen Psaki tell you a little bit about said border crisis. Uh, Ginger Goebbels, take it away. Were there expectations set with the Mexicans that they helped deal with the situation on the border? The, we, there, have been ex, there, have, there have been expectations set outside of... Uh, unrelated to uh, any vaccine doses or requests for them, that they would be partners in dealing with the crisis on the border. The what now? Wait, wait what was that? The crisis on the border. Could could you say that one more time, please? The crisis on the border. Uh, all right, guys. Maybe she just slipped up. Let's see. Somebody did ask a follow up question about this. Uh, let's let's hear Cooper from the press corps number four. Go ahead. When you were talking a moment ago about diplomatic negotiations between the United States and Mexico. Um, you said crisis on the border is, is was that a, uh, challenges issue? on the border? Oh, guys, it's just challenges at the border. Oh, okay. Well, that makes it definitely so, so different. 
it's a fucking crisis. Okay, let's look at the numbers here. I'm going to read an article here from The Hill. I believe Katie Pavlich wrote this article. Um, but she's writing about Alejandro Mayorkas, who is the new DHS secretary, and his handling of the border crisis. We get some actual numbers here, and then I'll talk about why all this is going on. So, from the article, and I quote, I think there is a challenge at the border we are managing, said Mayorkas. But the data, reporting, and actions of the Biden administration over the past three weeks show us there is, in fact, a crisis. And this goes on to uh, to provide a quote here saying, The number of unoccupied minors referred to the U- U.S. Office of Refugee Resettlement, the agency tasked with the caring for them once they cross the border, climbed from 1,530 in October to 3,300 and 64 in December, a 120% jump, USA Today reports. The agency usually has 13,764 beds for minors, but only has 7,971 that are currently available because of the COVID-19 social distancing restrictions. Of those, around 5,200 are occupied, leaving 2,700 open beds, according to the resettlement agency. The increase in unaccompanied minor arrivals has forced the Biden administration to open additional overflow facilities and new tent cities, which were called concentration camps and places of human rights abuses under President Trump's tenure. Hypocrisy aside, the Biden administration is using facilities because detention numbers have rapidly increased. If the pace continues, additional shelters will need to be constructed. According to the Customs and Border Protection, 13,000 unaccompanied minors are expected to cross in May alone. According to a report in Axios, no beacon of right-wing thought there, but Axios reports that Health and Human Services officially say the February numbers are, quote, the highest numbers we've ever seen in the history of the Unaccompanied Alien Child Program, end quote. And that's the end from the article. So why is this happening exactly? Well, there's two reasons. First is the rhetoric, and second is the policy. So the first is the rhetoric. When you go from Donald Trump saying, stop trying to come here. If you want asylum, go to the next country. Don't try to come here because you're not. if you're coming here from Brazil, you're not seeking asylum. You're coming to America. We're coming to America. And rightfully so. Don't blame you one bit for trying to come to America. But that's not what the asylum process is all about. You're not supposed to cross a, cross over five countries to get here and then say, oh, I'm seeking asylum. No, 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 no. You're supposed to escape your country and seek asylum wherever you may be at the safest conceivable country you can get to that is not your own, that apparently is so bad you are seeking asylum from. So when we go from the rhetoric of, if you come here, you're going to have to stay in Mexico until we work out your asylum claim and yada yada. We're building a wall and we want immigrants, but we want legal immigrants. When you go from that to President Useless Sack of Potatoes saying, come on in. We've got amnesties and amenities and vaccines awaiting for you. Come on in, people. That's why you have this massive uptick. As a matter of fact, Martha Raddatz of ABC News was doing an interview with some people that were trying to come across from the border, and she just point blank asked them, are you coming because Joe Biden's president? And the guy responded with, basically, yeah. <laughs> it's like, it's, even Martha Raddatz was like, oh, no, this, this is going to end up everywhere. And yeah, it should, because it's true. Rhetoric alone is enough to drive people here. When you, when you go from... Think of, think of America as a football coach. When you go from like the hard nose, badass, um, you know, Vince Lombardi type coach to the guy that like wants to play video games and chum around with everybody, you're going to have a disciplinary problem within the organization. When you go from a disciplinarian to a guy who wants to be everybody's friend, there's going to be some problems as far as a lack of discipline within the organization. And that's exactly what we're dealing with with our immigration policy is that we went from a stern, hard-nosed, by-the-book coach to a guy who just wants to be fucking pals with everybody and show off how cute his dogs are and chase them around naked in the bathroom and break his foot. Foot, that's when he's not tripping upstairs trying to get into Air Force One or just hiding in the corner while Kamala Harris runs the fucking country. So the rhetoric is bad enough. But what about the policy? Well, now that it's been established because Jen Psaki let it slip that it is an actual crisis at the border, despite the fact that they've been denying this for months 
even though, like I just said, CBP reported that February had the highest numbers they've ever had in the history of these unaccompanied alien child programs. And by the way, I really do like the unaccompanied alien child program, mostly because I'm sure it triggers the libs because of the word alien. Um, but nevertheless, so the rhetoric is one thing, like I said, what is the policy? What has changed so drastically? Well, in addition to the fact that we're just telling everybody to come on in, which gives the air that we are just more than happy to let you people in, here is the uh, here is some of the other things that they've done. On day one of Biden's administration, he decided to nix the remain in Mexico policy, which was the policy that Trump had put in place that said, OK, you're coming here for asylum. Fair enough. Come to the border, file for asylum, stay in Mexico. And if you get cleared, we'll let you in. Seems perfectly logical, right? It certainly sounds more reasonable than the catch and release program of come to the border, we'll house you for a couple hours or for a couple of days, and then we'll just release you into the interior of the country. But don't worry, we'll give you a court date. You could come back, but you won't because most of you, do. you just don't. Like well over 90% of people don't come back for their court dates because they know that they could just disappear into the country. And more importantly, they're being told by President Sack of Useless Potatoes and his colleagues in the Democratic Party that they're going to try to get all these people amnestied anyway. So what's the purpose of coming back and going through the legal process when they're just going to wave a magic wand and say none of these criminals are criminals anymore? I don't, it's, it has nothing to do with their race, for the record, because I could, I could feel the leftist anger. Oh, my God, this man hates Mexicans. I'm like, I've got no qualms with anybody, okay? I don't think people I have qualms with, the people that are pu purposely trying to ruin our country for the purposes of trying to get a bunch of votes in here, which is exactly what they're doing. They want to be the nice guys that let everybody in. Then they want to be the nice guys that amnesty everybody so that these people and their families will vote for these supposed nice guys, which brings me to something that I've been seeing a lot about. And obviously, we saw some evidence of in 2020 is that and, and this is a bold right opinion prediction here from Harrison Bergeron. But within the next five to 10 years, we're going to see a drastic shift of the Latino Latina vote to the Republican Party, because for a variety of reasons, they see through the bullshit on the immigration. The people that are here legally doing things the right, right way that consider themselves American absolutely doing, you know, they're seeing it through that bullshit. They're also seeing everything being turned into a black and a white issue, which leaves Hispanic people completely out of the equation. You've got the left, you know, shitting on religion at all turns. Hispanic populations tend to have a, a much higher, uh, much more faithful, you know, uh, uh, belief, I guess, it, in, in Christianity in particular. Um, so those, those things aren't going away because the leftists hate God and it will likely turn the Latino community away, not to mention their embrace of socialism, most of which uh, the immigrants from these places are fleeing, which is why they're here in the first place. So all of those things combined, plus the continual stuff like Latinx and trying to cancel Speedy Gonzalez, you keep on doing your thing, leftists. We will take all of the Latino votes somewhere down the line, I assure you. But uh, that brings me back to the policy. So in addition to getting rid of the Remain in Mexico policy, Biden also tried to halt all deportations, like immediately. He stopped construction on the wall. Look, you want to tell me that these are, quote, more humane policies? Okay, that's fine, maybe, for the people that are breaking the law. But are they more effective policies? Are they improving our border security? I defy anyone to tell me how any of these steps are improving our border security and stopping people from coming into this country illegally. How humane is it to tell people that it's totally fine to drag their kids across a fucking desert, come to the border, come on in, get a vaccine that should have gone to an American, come on into the country even though they're illegal and unaccounted for. All of these things are inhumane too. You know, I mean, all the people that have been killed by illegal immigrants that will never ever see any, you know, real ac accountability as a result of that. Not that that helps really at the end of the day anyway because they lost a loved one. But, I mean, just at the end of the day, there really is no logical reason for allowing people that broke the law to come into the country, allow them to continue to break the law, seemingly make it as easy as possible for them to break the law, and then promising them that somewhere down the line, they'll be pardoned from breaking the law that these idiots helped facilitate in the first place. So is it more humane? Yeah, maybe, if you're looking at it from a very particular perspective. Is it more effective? Obviously not. And the thing that I think pisses Biden off the most, and for that matter, the, the White House uh, the, or the press secretary, is the fact that Donald Trump, a guy who spent no time in government prior to becoming the president, had a better handle on this in weeks than Joe Biden has ever had over the course of his half century of being in office. It's baffling. It's almost like he's purposely doing the worst possible thing, and that's probably because that's the case. 
Moving on from there, let's go on to Asian hate. And yes, there was obviously a big mass shooting that occurred down in Atlanta, Georgia. I think you guys know some of the story. I'll get into it in a second. But before I do, I just want to pose a few questions here in relation to this story. If Tiger Woods walked into a Perkins and shot a bunch of white Perkins waitresses, would we assume that was because he was a black or Asian supremacist? No, we'd probably think to ourselves, oh, this is a guy who's had a problem in the past with fucking a bunch of Perkins waitresses and is trying to remove temptation. I can assure you, if it was Tiger Woods, they would not jump to some sort of racial narrative, even though he's of one color and the victims are of another color. And we have a whole backstory that might explain exactly what happened there. And it wasn't racism, so they probably wouldn't. All right, let's let's admit, let's muddy the waters a little bit more. What if Robert Kraft, owner of the Patriots, shot up an Asian massage parlor? Would a normal person not accept the same rationale that the shooter provided, which was that he was a sex addict and he was trying to remove temptation? Or would a normal person immediately jump to the fact that Robert Kraft is white and these people are Asian, so it must be white supremacy? I mean, sadly, we know in that case the media would run with the latter because he supported Donald Trump, and obviously anything having to do with that is obviously tied to white supremacy, so he must be a white supremacist, hence he shot all those Asian people. So, predictably, when there was a shooting, a rando guy, white guy, walked into three Asian massage parlors in Atlanta, Georgia, and shot eight people, six of which happened to be Asian women, they immediately turned to the white supremacy narrative. And they somehow tied this in with the AAPI hate going on, the Asian American Pacific Islander hate going on in the world right now. And particularly in in America, we're seeing an uptick in violence against Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders. Now, this was largely ignored by the mainstream media up until the shooting because the people that were perpetrating the crimes were largely not white and henceforth couldn't be tied to white supremacy. But now we've got a white guy who shot a bunch of Asian women. And because of those two facts alone, it is obviously this rise in white supremacy. Now, some of the things that have come out of this story are ridiculous, right? So we've got in the wake of the shooting, a police officer has basically had his life ruined for merely quoting the suspect when the suspect said to him that he had had, quote, a bad day. This was somehow painted as the cop showing sympathy for the suspect and downplaying the horrific events that he had just caused. It was obviously neither of the above. He was simply quoting what the suspect had said to him. And the suspect said, I had a bad day. Fact check true. He did, in fact, have a bad day. And he did, in fact, say that to that police officer. That said... He was not showing sympathy for the suspect who just walked into three massage parlors and killed eight people. That was not what he was doing. And only a radical lunatic who watches CNN could conceivably think that that was probably what was going on there. Thankfully, it looks like that characterization seems to have been corrected actually by some people even in the media on the left of which I will tip my hat to them because a few people did come out. I think Matthew Iglesias uh, was one of them. He writes for Vox, and he's an idiot normally, but he's coming around a little bit. He's one of the few people that's starting to come to the realization that that there's a, there is a much more important battle going on in this country than left versus right, and I'm going to talk about that in the next segment here. But Matthew Iglesias is another one of those people that I think is starting to figure that out. That said, the word had already gone out that this police officer was some sort of racist and obviously sympathized with this racist shooter of which there is no evidence that he actually did anything racist. So it turns out that the police, having interviewed the suspect and having listened to what the suspect had to say, it appears that the suspect provided his motivation for these attacks. He claims he is has a sex addiction of which he is very much ashamed and continues to fall into the temptation thereof. But More importantly than those comments is that he said that he's a sex addict, that he's succumbed to temptation. He wanted to remove some of these places that tempt him, a.k.a. these massage parlors, which I think were probably safe to say giving out a little bit more than a massage, if you know what I'm saying. And uh, this, by the way, was corroborated by two former associates of the suspect who backed up his claims of his sexual depravity and the fact that uh, this guy shot specifically Asian massage parlors, right? He didn't shoot up a Chinese food restaurant, an Asian market, a nail salon, a dry cleaner, a camera store, only massage parlors, and only these three massage parlors, leading me to believe that it probably is tied more to his sexual depravity than his hate of Asian people, because certainly you could have found other places where Asian people 
often congregate. But that's the story here is obviously this is some sort of white supremacy. And obviously, how did I forget this part? Orange man bad, right? Duh. Here you go. I think there's no question that uh, some of the damaging rhetoric uh, that we saw uh, during the prior administration, uh, blaming, uh, you know, calling COVID, uh, you know, the Wuhan virus or other things, um, uh, led to, um, you know, um, perceptions of the Asian American community that are inaccurate, unfair, uh, have uh, raised, um, you know, threatening, uh, have, has elevated threats against uh, Asian Americans. And we're seeing that uh, around the country. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm, no, I'm calling bullshit on all of this. OK, so you're telling me that Trump called this thing the China fire virus for a year and it took not only a year, but two months after Donald Trump left office to manifest into a white supremacist marching into a bunch of Asian massage parlors and shooting a bunch of people and then explicitly telling the police that it was because he has a sex addiction and because he didn't want to be tempted. And so he killed these temptresses that he thought were exact, doing exactly that and probably were. I mean, let's face it. He, he probably knew these specific places were given the old rub and tug. He probably frequented some of these places and he wanted to eliminate them as possibilities for him to attend moving forward. All of that spelled out in plain English. Nope, it's got to be white supremacy. It's got to be. He's white. I mean, obviously, he wouldn't admit that he's a racist. No, nah, he's the type of guy that'll walk into a massage parlor and open fire on a bunch of people he doesn't even know in all likelihood. But no, he's, he definitely doesn't want to be a racist. Homicidal maniac? Totally cool. He's fine with that perception. But he, God, he doesn't. He really would rather not be a racist. Yeah, that makes sense. Again, if you're an idiot who watches CNN and MSNBC and reads the New York Times and the Washington Post, you've been completely misled. And it's only a matter of time before you realize that fact, which brings me to the next segment. This is a, a reoccurring segment, not a weekly or a monthly segment even, but it does happen every so often when a leftist does the right thing. Who's our leftist this week? Well, he keeps kind of popping up in this segment. This happens every so often. Hey, a broken clock right twice a day, a blind squirrel occasionally finds a nut. And every so often, Bill Maher says something that makes total fucking sense. I don't like him any more than you do, but here he is. And finally, new rule, you're not going to win the battle for the 21st century if you are a silly people. And Americans are a silly people. That's the classic phrase from Lawrence of Arabia when Lawrence tells his Bedouin allies that as long as they stay a bunch of squabbling tribes, they will remain a silly people. Well, we're the silly people now. Do you know who doesn't care that there's a stereotype of a Chinese man in a Dr. Seuss book? China. All 1.4 billion of them could give a crouching tiger flying fuck. You see, Bill Maher, and he goes on there, and he kind of talks up China, and he says, look at all the wonderful things China does, and, and only once during the six-minute monologue does he recognize the fact that they're basically like a slave state, right, and that they have to do everything that their government tells them to do, including being welded into their homes in order to stop the spread of a pandemic that they started through either negligence or or maliciousness still to be determined. But Bill Maher gets the cultural stuff. This is a guy who's been canceled long before cancellations were a thing. He gets free speech. Uh, he's got some views that obviously don't put him in line with most of us on the right. He's not a big fan of, of God. He doesn't mind abortion. He doesn't really think you should have guns on the, on the scale that most of us, I think, would find acceptable. But neither here nor there. When he gets these things, we have to applaud him. Hey, when leftists do the right thing... We here at The Right Opinion will applaud them. And he's not the only one. There's plenty of them out there. They're figuring it out, is that there is a battle that, that is moving forward in the U.S., and it is the real battle. And it, it's not black versus white. It's not atheist versus theist. It's not even red versus blue. It's the woke versus the rest of us. Bill Maher gets it. Glenn Greenwald gets it. Pierce Morgan gets it. Barry Weiss, formerly of the New York Times, gets it. And this is just the beginning. If you had told me even a year or two ago that these people would be in my foxhole fighting the good fight, I would have told you you were fucking crazy. But here they are. Because they've broken from the woke mold 
And now all of them castigated. Glenn Greenwald is like as leftist as leftist gets. But every time he sends anything out on Twitter nowadays, there's a mob of still sucking at the tea to the mainstream media losers that can't handle the fact that a, a gay liberal guy broke from the from the mold and is now out doing his own thing and doing it better than most. Same with Barry Weiss, for that matter. She was castigated all within the the, the New York Times as, you know, obviously they were, they were saying all these anti-Semitic and mean and awful things to her because she had the audacity to not be, you know, 100% behind the woke agenda. She was 98% of the way behind the woke agenda. And now they've turned around and they're trying to cancel their own and I'm fucking here for it. Which actually, I was going to close the show with this, but uh, I'll, I'll make mention of all of those people that I just mentioned, or most of them, at least Glenn Greenwald and Barry Weiss, have Substacks. Uh, check it out. Substack.com. I believe if you go to greenwall.substack.com or barryweiss.substack.com or just search Substack and those people's names in your uh, search engine of choice, I guess, you'll find them real quick. These are independent journalists. I don't always agree with them, but they are not willing to cater to the mainstream mob. And even though their their thoughts and their their processes might very well align with a lot of those people, they've been kicked out of the cool kids club because they had the audacity to disagree or question the narrative in any way, shape, or form. So check them out over there. They're independent journalists at Substack that um, basically it's their own feed. They can write whatever they want. They don't have editors to answer to. They can get their word out there directly to you without going through an editorial board. And uh, as as a result, I've actually started my own. So you could check out writeopinionpod.substack.com. I believe it is, but I'm going to have the link in the show notes for you. Uh, look, I want you to check mine out, and I'm going to write some articles on there from time to time. I'm not going to lie. They're not going to be daily. They might not even be weekly. But when I think there's something important and I want to get it out and I'm in between episodes and maybe I'm bored at work, these are the things that I'm, I'm going to try to do a little bit more of. So check out my Substack. It, again, the link will be in the show notes. But more importantly, check out Substack in general because it's really coming under fire from the mainstream media because they're slowly realizing that their grip on the flow of information is collapsing again like it did when the Internet started. They tried to rein that in a little bit. And now there's things like Substack that are out there, and oh, never mind, they just got pulled off the internet. No, I'm just kidding, but uh, seriously, my link will be in the show notes. Check out my Substack. I got one article up there. It's a bit of a culture piece on Marvel's The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, a little prediction that I, I um, had before the first episode debuted, and from what I could tell from the first episode, I'm not that far off, but hey, read the article judge for yourselves and uh, like I said the link will be in the show notes to my substack but check out other people's substacks surely if you are an independent if you have a a journalist or two that you follow out there they might be on there and then you can get their stories directly from them as opposed to waiting for their editor to approve and nitpick and you know maybe even completely destroy a given story before it actually gets out to you you can get it directly from the guy who's getting it directly from the source or the gal I guess last but not least here my favorite story of the week. It was a really bad week to be a really wealthy person trying to raise money on GoFundMe. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Let's start with Kendall Jenner. Kendall Jenner, for the record, is a billionaire with a B, largely because of cosmetic-type products that she sold, I believe, and obviously keeping up with the Kardashians and being a whore. Um, these things are all relevant because... Kendall Jenner's makeup artist apparently was in some sort of accident and requires surgery in order to, uh, to, to save her life or improve her life or get her back to normal, whatever the case may be. I think it's like a $50,000 surgery from what I understand. Kendall Jenner, instead of just fucking paying this herself and taking all the goodwill that would come along with that and probably, you know, a little bit of karma, she set up a GoFundMe page for her fans to pay for her makeup artist's surgery while she, a billionaire, only donated $5,000. It's worth note, by the way, that Kendall Jenner's makeup artist is largely the reason that she's a billionaire, because if we've ever seen her without makeup, good lord, uh, it ain't fucking sunshine and rainbows, let me tell you that. We all remember how awkward she looked when she was a kid running around. It, it's, it, I mean, it's been a transformation largely plastic surgery-wise, but also because of the makeup artist, you would think she'd have a little bit of gratitude for the person that made her look like she actually knows what she's doing in terms of makeup and allowed her to make a billion dollars. It's all very fascinating if it wasn't also fucking stupid. And that brings me to an even better one. 
Oh my, Megan and Harry, the Royals. I look, I don't want to waste any time on the Royals here on this show because frankly, I think Americans as, as a whole are way too obsessed with this fucking group of inbreds that we broke away from 250 years ago and probably should have never looked back. Oh, by the, oh, I mean, I guess World War II. You're welcome, by the way. Um, but neither here nor there. Megan and Harry's mortgage fund on GoFundMe. So somebody put out a GoFundMe in the wake of the Megan and Harry interview with Oprah. For which they made millions of dollars, by the way, which is sort of funny. And this person made a GoFundMe to pay off Meghan and Harry's mortgage, saying that it would be nice a nice gift to them now that they're financially independent. <laughs> they're financially independent. Oh, God. So they're, now that they're financially independent, they no longer have the backing of the crown. It would be a nice gift to pay for their mortgage. Yes, the $14 million mortgage of Meghan and Harry that is being paid for by Diana, Princess Diana's uh, fund, uh, trust that she basically left for her son. I believe there's $25 million in there, so they could have paid for this house in cash, essentially, if they wanted to, but they didn't. But we should be paying for it. Yeah. My God. The only thing more hilarious than the idea that this GoFundMe was ever started in the first place or that somebody thought it was a good idea is that people actually donated to this. But not a lot. Two people donated to this. A grand total of two people donated to this cause. And they donated a grand total of $105. (laughs) It's too too much. It's too much. I can't. Who are these fucktards? Who are the morons? that donated $100 and $5, respectively, to Meghan and Harry to try to pay off their $14 million mortgage. Baffling, people. I am actually floored. Every week, I come on here, or every month, or whatever, every, every episode, I sit down and I come up with something. I find some story that I think is really, we finally reached peak stupid. And then something like this happens. I hate to say it. Bill Maher's right. We are are a silly people. But you're not silly people. Not you. You listen to the right opinion. So you know already that opinions are like assholes. Everybody's got one. And this asshole just so happens to have the right opinion. You can only catch it right here at therightopinion.podbean.com, hominmediagroup.podbean.com, and ratsaladreview.com. Check out the merch store in the links. Check out the sub stack in the links. And follow me on social media at rightopinionpod on Twitter, Parlor, and Instagram. And since I've already given you the obligatory asshole line, I just want to thank you all for joining me. I've been Harrison Bergeron. This has been The Right Opinion. You guys have been fan-fucking-tastic. I'll talk to you next time. Peace! Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Be the elephant in the room in a room full of elephants. Boom! Boom.